For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. I want to give you this bizarre hypothetical scenario. This man right here is two-wing quarterback Michael Pratt. He's not projected to be a first-round pick by any means, but he's projected by just about everyone to get drafted at some point during the 2024 NFL Draft and he'll go sometime in the middle rounds. Now, let's assume that there was a rumor flying that said that one team that was super interested in drafting Pratt was the Baltimore Ravens. They do need a backup quarterback, as unless you're counting Josh Johnson, who feels like he's 85 years old at this point, there's no one there really backing up Lamar Jackson. The rumor was that the Ravens had multiple meetings with him. They worked him out. They had dinner with him and they basically unveiled the red carpet for him, making it very clear that they want him. That's the rumor, and that's what Pratt himself is saying. Then, just days before the draft, and I truly mean days before the draft, Pratt apologizes. He says, look guys, I'm sorry. I confused the Baltimore Ravens with the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Ravens were the ones doing all of this and acting interested in me. The Steelers were. I couldn't tell the two apart. I didn't know the difference. And he's not kidding or playing a joke on someone. No, he genuinely believes this. Immediately, you would think to yourself, wait a second, time out. Is this guy crazy? How do you not know whether you're on a job interview for Pittsburgh or Baltimore? Those are two completely separate teams with two completely separate staffs in two completely separate cities. How can you possibly go to the Steelers facility land in Pittsburgh, stay in a hotel in Pittsburgh, talk to members of the Steelers, look at the Steelers logo, and think to yourself the entire time that you're in Baltimore talking with the Ravens. It seems too stupid to believe. Well, I bring this up because of the 1990 NFL Draft. I kid you not, this actually happened. At the 1990 NFL Draft, there was one prospect who was being heavily interviewed by one team, was being completely talked about by one team, and was rumored to go to that one team. Only for him to realize that he completely mixed up the two places and confused one team with another team in a completely different city, with a completely different staff, in a completely different color scheme. Because this is the story behind Washington quarterback Harry Conklin and the bizarre controversy surrounding him at the 1990 NFL Draft. Before I talk about the bizarre controversy and the rumor in question, we need some context to understand just how good this guy was, and why the team in question would have even been interested in the man in the first place. The year is 1990, and coming into this draft class is a quarterback out of the University of Washington taking the country by storm by the name of Kerry Conklin. From a statistical standpoint, Conklin was one of the better quarterbacks in the sport, and he saved his best for last, as during his senior campaign in 1989, his 2,569 passing yards set a Washington school record for the most passing yards in a single season. Now, he did have his flaws. He had some turnover issues, leading the Pac-10 in interceptions with 17. He did have a negative touchdown-to-interception ratio in all four years of college which wasn't the biggest steal back in the 1980s, but was still notable. And his deep ball accuracy was lacking at times, as he had a tendency to overshoot guys past 20 yards. However, in what was projected by many as a weak quarterback class, Conklin stood out as one of the top options, and a man who had the tools to succeed with just a little bit of refinement. I mean, you don't throw 16 touchdowns, finishing third in the conference in that category, and lead your team to an 8-4 record, a Freedom Bowl win, and a top 25 end-of-season ranking by complete accident. And especially after Conklin impressed at the Freedom Bowl that went over Florida and in the Hula Bowl, where he won the MVP in both games, and after he impressed at the NFL Combine, it seemed that Conklin was going to be a high draft pick. In fact, there were multiple scouts that said that Conklin was so good that he would be the first quarterback off the board. Now, Illinois quarterback Jeff George hadn't declared by that point of the comment, so don't worry, these scouts were not completely off the rocker, but you get the idea. 
For some more perspective of what we were looking at heading into that 1990 draft the week of, here is a report from the Atlanta Journal. Harry Conklin was the third best quarterback on the board, only behind Illinois quarterback Jeff George and Houston quarterback Andre Ware. An article by Dave Goldberg of the Associated Press had Conklin as a first-round pick, thinking that he would be the third quarterback off the board. Another pre-draft ranking, this one from the Post Crescent, had Conklin as the fourth quarterback and a second-round pick, with the three quarterbacks ahead of him being the two aforementioned guys and Utah quarterback Scott Mitchell, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And the Gannett News Service had Conklin as the fourth quarterback off the board, going in the second round. Conklin was the hot name at quarterback going into that 1990 draft, and he was skyrocketing up boards. And it seemed like a lot of teams wanted him. And it seemed like Conklin was going to receive interest and hear his name called very early on. And while there were a lot of teams vying for his services to be their signal caller, there was one in particular that seemed to be the most interested and seemed to be the favorites to land him based on all the rumors. That team? None other than the New York Football Giants. Now, there are some teams that need a quarterback because their current signal caller is absolutely terrible. And there are some teams that need a quarterback because their current signal caller is getting up there in age and is awfully close to losing to father time. And the Giants fit in that latter category. Yes, Phil Simms was a prominent quarterback in the league, and had been the franchise guy for the Giants for the better part of the 1980s. In 1985, he made it to the Pro Bowl, and in 1986, with maybe the greatest performance by any quarterback in the history of the Super Bowl, he got in New York to its first ever Super Bowl title, winning Super Bowl 21 over the Denver Broncos, in a game that you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Having said that, he was going to be 35 years old heading into the 1990 season, Today, 35 years old isn't that old for a quarterback, as these guys can seemingly play into their late 30s before dropping off. But back in 1990, once you were closer to 40 than you were to 30, it was time to start thinking about the future to some extent. And this was especially true because Sims did not have the best of seasons in 1989, throwing just 14 touchdowns and 14 interceptions across his 15 starts. His 14 touchdown passes were the fewest he threw in a season since 1983, when he only threw 13 passes. He ended the season super cold, as over the final 10 games of the season, including the playoffs, Sims threw just 5 touchdown passes and 8 interceptions. New York's passing offense was in the bottom half of the league in a lot of categories for a reason that year. And over the final 3 games, including that 1989 divisional round game against the Rams, he threw no touchdowns while completing just 49% of his passes. Now, don't get me wrong, Simmons was going to be the guy heading into 1990. There wasn't really any talk about the Giants moving on from Sims and trying to upgrade at the quarterback position. But there was definitely belief, and understandably and rightfully so, that time was running out for Sims, and the Giants needed to start thinking about a succession plan, especially because Jeff Hostetler, as the backup, hadn't shown anything yet in his career, was becoming disgruntled, and was approaching 30. Now obviously, that statement is going to look hysterical in hindsight in about 8 months from the time of the draft. The rumors were swirling, and it seemed like an absolute walk that the man you've been watching this whole time, Washington quarterback Harry Conklin, was going to go to the Giants barring anything crazy, maybe even in the first round. The New York Daily News posted this about what happens if the Giants draft a Conklin in round one, which you don't do unless there's smoke, and where there's smoke, there's fire. Conklin not only would have liked to have played for the Giants, but the Giants were literally his favorite team growing up. Yes, playing in the NFL is nice, but playing for your favorite team? That's gotta be a whole nother level of nice. Said Conklin, They were always my team. I lived and died with Phil Simms and it would be a perfect place for me, learning from a great quarterback instead of being pushed right out on the field to start. I do find that comment awfully fascinating, seeing as Conklin openly admitted that the best thing for him would be to sit and learn for a bit instead of not playing right away. Not many guys, especially guys projected to go in the first round, 
say that directly up front and outright and bluntly. And I respect Conklin a lot for that. But that raises the question. Where were these rumors coming from? Who was originating these rumors that led everyone to believe that Kerry Conklin was going to be a New York Giant by the time the 1990 NFL Draft ended? Well, the source was a pretty good one. The source was none other than Conklin's own mother. You see, Kerry and his mother, Lorraine, had an incredible relationship from everything I could tell. And as Kerry was going through this process, he tried to inform his mother every step of the way about where he was and what he was doing. I'm sure there are a lot of relationships like that based on a strong familial bond. Especially because moms do so much in helping their sons get to this point in the first place. And according to Conklin's own mother, Lorraine, the Giants were super interested. How interested? He worked out with the Giants not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. I don't know about you, but when you're holding four separate workouts or job interviews with one team, that's a pretty good indication that they're interested in you in some capacity. Even at your regular line of work, no one is giving you four interviews without at least thinking about bringing you on board. And to add on to that, Conklin flew out to New Jersey to meet with the Giants, which again, is always a good sign when a prospect is meeting at a team's facility and meeting the staff and doing all of that. Lorraine was incredibly in the loop, and in doing so, reporters also found out about this interest and began reporting that Conklin and the Giants were showing serious interest in each other, that Conklin to the Giants seemed like a lock, and that Conklin was likely going to be the successor to Phil Sims, if not in 1991, then in 1992. Which is why you'll probably never believe me when I tell you that none of what I just said regarding New York's interest in Conklin was even the slightest bit true. Yes, Conklin flew out and met with a team. Yes, he had four workouts with one team. But that team wasn't New York. That team was Washington. As in, a team in a completely different city, with a completely different staff, and a completely different color scheme from a logo perspective. In fact, at no point did the Giants show any interest in Conklin. There was a brief conversation that Conklin had with Giants general manager George Young at the Combine, and that was it. All of these meetings and workouts and whatnot were taking place with Washington. None of them were taking place with New York. Carrie Conklin's mother, Lorraine, somehow confused New York with Washington. And uh, I, I would do the whole I'm sorry what thing right now, but I'm still recovering from ammonia, so we're not going to do that. But you can insert one here if you wish. Just know I'm thinking it. We're all thinking it. How the heck do you confuse New York with Washington? It'd be one thing if Conklin said that he was in New York and his mother thought it was the Jets. Or it'd be one thing if Conklin said that he was in Los Angeles and his mother thought it was the Raiders instead of the Rams. I don't at least get that. I don't get this. I'm just trying to imagine how these conversations even wait. Hey, son, how are you? I'm good. I'm in Washington right now meeting with Joe Gibbs. Oh, that's awesome, sweetie. I'm so happy New York is interested in you. Or, hey, son, are you going to be home for Easter this year? I'll see. Washington wants me to work out with them. Okay, well, that's exciting being in New York for Easter. How does this confusion even happen? And that's especially true because... Considering the great relationship that Lorraine and Carrie seem to have with each other, I'm assuming Lorraine knew that Carrie was a Giants fan. So Lorraine knows the difference between New York and Washington, since they're rivals. And I'm sure Carrie would be the first to tell Lorraine, glowing with excitement if his favorite team was actually interested in him. The whole situation just confuses me tremendously. I don't think it was a ploy by his mother, knowing that his son was a Giant fan, to try and get him on the Giants and she just picked the funniest way to go about it. I don't think it was Carrie lying to his mother the whole time, because he'd have no incentive to lie. And then he wouldn't throw his own mother under the bus in the press conference. This is just one of the most hysterical pre-draft false rumors that I've ever seen in my life, genuinely. And you might be saying, well, wait a second. Maybe Carrie's mother wasn't in the best of health conditions and had some trouble remembering details. And if that was the case, then yes, 100%. I would not be making light of this situation, and it'd be incredibly sad and a tragic story that you believe ESPN would milk the ever-loving crap out of 
during that 1990 draft coverage. But from all accounts that I could find, that was not the case at all. Lorraine Conklin was born on April 19th, 1936. So at the time of these comments made before the draft, she was 53 years old, so she was not an old age by any means. Lorraine would pass away in 2022 at the age of 85, so she still had another 30 plus years left after her son got drafted on this planet. So it's not as though her health was rapidly declining by any means. This was just an absolutely hilarious brain fart that went on for months that I can't imagine how anyone could possibly make considering all of the circumstances at play here. From the favorite team aspect, to the fact that it wasn't just one meeting with Washington, but rather an absolute crap ton of meetings, to the point where it seemed like her son was spending the vast majority of the pre-draft process in Washington. And it's going to come as a shock to absolutely no one that when all was said and done, at the 1990 NFL Draft, sure enough, Carrie Conklin went to Washington. Meaning that he was going from Washington to Washington, albeit on two completely different sides of the country. Conklin went a bit lower than he thought. He thought he'd be the third quarterback off the board, and at worst, would be a second round pick. But in actuality, he was a fourth round pick. Joe's with pick number 86 as the seventh quarterback off the board. Unfortunately, Conklin didn't do a whole lot in the NFL. He threw five touchdown passes in his career, and didn't win a single game as a starter, so his name has definitely fallen by the wayside amongst NFL fans. But he did win as many games with Washington as he did with the New York Giants, so I guess in that regard, I can see why his mother confused the two teams. But even though Conklin's NFL career didn't quite go as planned, it doesn't make this story any less crazy and any less hysterical. Because I guess there are some times in life where mother does not know best. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.